Over a thousand years ago in Wagadu, the ancient empire of Ghana, the Soninke were persecuting the population, and the Karkolo people were preparing to escape the tyranny. The hunters established a confraternity, a bit like the Masons, proclaiming liberty, equality, brotherhood, and understanding between all people, with no distinction of class, birth, belief, or origin. Nobles, slaves, and ordinary men, side by side. This confraternity continued down the centuries, and despite the disappearance of the big game, it still exists today, and is especially active throughout West Africa. The unity of the hunter's confraternity is founded on a myth perpetuated in oral tradition. Back in those days, in the empire of Ghana, there was a great period of drought. One day, a woman set out to cross the country at the same time as two hunters, but in opposite directions. She carried a child on her back and on her head a gourd of fresh water. The hunters, along with their dogs, intentionally being hard on themselves, left with no water. On the fourth day they met. The two thirsty hunters wanted to drink some of the water she carried, but she refused. Whereupon they seized the gourd and drank their fill, pouring the rest on the ground for their dogs. As the woman bombarded them with insults, mainly concerned with their doubtful parentage, the hunters rushed toward the woman, seized the child, and threw him to the ground. He was rapidly devoured by the famished dogs. This macabre feast ends with a battle for the child's big toe. One dog overturns the other and rips out its throat. Taking revenge, the owner of the dead dog kills the killer dog, whereupon the other hunter fires an arrow into his companion before impaling himself through the chest. The woman, stricken with pain, keeps striking the hunter's bodies. It is then that God revives the hunters and their dogs, proving that he alone decides life and death on earth. As they died, the hunters and their dogs had released excrement. So each man offers the other a bouquet of leaves to clean it off. By burying the leaves with their excrement and that of their dogs in a triangle formed by the forking of three roads, they forge their bonding forever. Thus was created the cult of Sanine and Contran, which is the basis even today of the confraternity's moral code. It symbolizes the triumph of life over death and friendship over hate. In the end, it is the expression of eternal fidelity and respect. Hunters who in the past were nomads traveling through forest and bush are today sedentary farmers because the game has disappeared. In the Sinofu village of Olonkutu, in the heart of Burkina Faso's most prosperous region, lives Nafale Kone, chief of all the hunters in the province. Village life is directly dependent on the land, nourishing land that gives life Earth mixed with straw that protects people and cereal crops. Earth sculpted by women for feeding the family. After the ever-living mythical ancestors and the spirits of great hunters associated with rites are found in the confraternity the chief guarantor of upholding the laws, old hunters who assist him, master hunters who are responsible for training and initiating novices the main body of hunters, the postulants, and finally, the chanters who preserve the oral tradition in song. Among themselves, the hunters say, my elder or my younger, according to degree of initiation, not according to age. In addition to the degree of initiation, mutual respect between the hunters is also a function of their exploits. Those who have killed big game, elephants, buffaloes, hippopotami, or pythons, are accorded greater respect from elders. Game of any sort is rare. The huge animals that in the past made the reputations of the old hunters are now only the stuff of dreams. 
Hunting has become more spiritual than substantial. The confraternity is organized into many independent local associations, but they're united by the original myth of Sanine and Contran. If in the past they hunted with bows and thrown projectiles or even nets, today the rifle has replaced all those old weapons. The chanters go along on hunting forays. They're not grillo, they belong to no caste. They're well trained, but are rarely hunters, even if they dress like them and wear the same magic charms. The chanters have only one weapon, their way with words. This day, a celebrated chanter Isa Diabate is in charge of praising the great hunters and instructing the young initiates. Going back to the original myth symbolizing the bouquets of leaves the hunters gave each other, these cadets of the confraternity, as a sign of allegiance and respect, give their chief branches which form a ritual seat for him. It might appear that with the introduction of firearms, the balance of force between hunter and animal is broken, but the reality is quite different. Of course, the animal pays with its life in the face of the hunter's appetite. But in so doing, a living, vengeful force is released and pursues the hunter to his dying day. This force is the Niyama and is the spiritual base of the confraternity. The hunters ceaselessly defend against it and try to tame it. In the original myth, leaves and excrement are buried along with the child's big toe that the dogs fought over and the fragments of the broken gourd in which the woman carried the water. Then it was all covered with an anthill. This sacred place is still today called Dankun. Returning to the village with the woman, the hunters swear to serve her for the rest of their lives. So she is the one who asks them to create a new Dankun near the village. And they place objects similar to those in the original. After this, they burn three roosters and purify their weapons in the fire of burning branches. In memory of this ritual, the hunters purify their weapons in the heat above the glowing embers into which they have thrown a magic power, one that protects them from the Niyama. Before setting off into the bush, Grand Master Nafale Kone placates the spirits, performing a divination using two halves of a kola nut. He also commemorates the sacrifice of the three roosters, making a triple offering of cola juice above this object that can conjure up evil forces. This triple offering, intended to guarantee better protection against the Niyama, is performed as a triangle, symbol of the Dankun, marking the separation between the three territories, the wild bush, cultivated land, and the village.
The two balanced arrows that make up this object symbolize the original killings. Following a master's instructions, the hunters set out in small groups. Each action, simple as it may seem, is accompanied by magic words intended to augment the hunter's chances or protect them from evil powers. Recruitment of hunters is done exclusively by members' vote. Every applicant for the confraternity must first link himself to the master hunter of his choice, agree to respect all the laws, and submit to an initiation of two or three years. Criteria for admission are the candidate's character and his reputation with regard to women. In this regard, an adage says, when one learns to control his feet, the belt of his trousers and his mouth, he is assured a life of easy passage through the world. Beyond his human qualities, the young hunter has to prove to the community his ability to uncover and kill game. So, rooting out porcupines in rocky wastes where they take refuge during the day is a dangerous practice, and there are frequent encounters with snakes. It is believed that as soon as an animal is killed, its body is covered with a layer of niyama. So the hunter places a magic powder in each of its orifices to contain the evil force or to reduce its effects. The animal is then bled and some of its blood smeared all over the lucky charm that protects the master hunter. If the great hunters know how to spread death, they also know how to preserve life in various ways. They concoct therapeutic or magic medicines using plants, animal substances, and minerals. Whenever they take something from nature, they're very careful and pronounce prayers or offer reparative sacrifices.
The fly swatter, or more precisely, the magisterial stick, is the symbol of the hunter's craft and his membership in the confraternity. His wooden whistle, held to be magical, is used to communicate with his fellows, the spirits or ancestors, to announce the death of an animal or completion of a ritual, to find directions, or to ask for help. A foretelling will guide this day the presence of this plant on each side of the path will be a good sign that today an antelope will be encountered. An animal's niyama is in proportion to its vital resistance, its massiveness, appearance, and the fear it engenders. It is the cause of all sickness, problems in daily life, and death. Each time that a hunter fells an animal, he knows that its niyama will pursue him until achieving vengeance. The rifle he holds fires, and it will be said that he is the victim of that creature's niyama, that he will lose his children when they are young, and they will say that the niyama of a great python will afflict his lineage. When the hunter is young and inexperienced and his victim has a virulent niyama using his whistle, he summons a master hunter or rushes to the village and announces his exploit to the confraternity. Then his master or another hunter designated by him, but in his presence, will perform ritual gestures. Sometimes this is an occasion for the young hunter to acquire a new level of knowledge that had been hidden from him theretofore. The balance of forces that exists between the hunter and the animal is measured here by the multiplicity of the ritual acts performed, directing the flow of malignant energy into a magic charm, ritual washing, prayers, or even divination. Despite all that, animal niyamas little by little penetrate into a man and live there within him. It is believed that it is this interior force that is manifested spectacularly at the moment of the hunter's death. In the throes of death he cries out and writhes and agonizes as his victims had done when they died. Before gathering at the agreed meeting point for the morning, the hunters use their whistles to announce their successes in the bush. Hunters already at the meeting point answer to guide them in. Whenever an animal with a powerful niyama is killed, chanters and hunters come to welcome the heroes of the day. 
As a sign of respect and recognition, they prostrate themselves and offer leafy branches in memory of the offerings made by the two ancestors in the original myth. Whistles blare forth to tell the animals in the bush of the hunter's victory over one of them. As a sign of submission and respect for their chief, the heroes of the day crawl and offer their bounty. The chanters, singing their mythical tales with their legendary chronicles, accounts of the great hunters. They're joking. With their proverbs and philosophical lessons, they create a great fresco of all human society. It is with considerable lyricism and a certain genius that they approach their songs of praise. The really great chanting singers, like Issa Diabate here, are beloved of many hunters in many regions of Burkina Faso and even beyond. They can recall the names and exploits of hundreds of hunters living and dead. The latter are often honored in eulogies. The discourse is sometimes literal, sometimes fanciful, but always powerfully evocative. It's one of the main sources for training young hunters. All the hunters are allowed to perform certain dances, but there are some dances that are reserved for the few. Each category of hunter, whether he has killed a large animal or escaped a dangerous situation with cool courage or been wounded in combat, each one has his own hymn. And when the chanters start singing one, every hunter concerned rises and dances, and the others learn from this. The chanters are also past masters at making allusions to, but never naming, the incapable hunters, hoping to motivate them to follow the example of the brave.
Whenever latecomers return empty-handed, they offer a bunch of leaves to their chief as a sign of respect. Nothing of value comes into the confraternity without being inspected by all. The procedure follows protocol from the lowest member up to the chief who decides the object's final destination. <laughs> Before making a glorious entrance into the village, the singers tune their instruments. If one consults the code of the confraternity, a hunter's only country is the bush, his only family, his fellow hunters. To preserve the unity of this great family, a last rifle shot is fired to alert any possible latecomers. <laughs> An accounting of the hunters begins using small sticks. Even better, every old hunter who stayed in the village is himself represented by one of these counting instruments. In the past, these small sticks were objects of sacrifice, and this made them sacred. So the hunters return to the village in triumph, their chief in the lead along with the singers. <laughs> in the confraternity, the old hunters always hold a place of honor. Here they are sharing the most beautiful feathers taken in this hunt. The confraternity is a great humanistic organization where sharing is the rule. After being prepared, the game will be distributed to hunters' families, as well as to the poor, and to widows and orphans. <laughs> Just as with the two original ancestors who deliberately made things hard for themselves, these hunters have had nothing to eat or drink all day. And surely this gives the meal prepared in the village by the women a very special savor. <laughs> Children also play a part in the community of hunters. 
The water they bring up from the village well relieves the pain caused by thirst, and they turn this arduous task into a sort of entertainment. This day is for ritual and festivities. It is an occasion for the master hunters to display their skill to the novices of the confraternity and to all the people of the village. The newly initiated perfect their understanding, and the chanting singers transmit their knowledge for prestige and for money. Words, music, and dance take on enormous importance for the hunters. It is at these festivals that the novices learn from the mouths of the chanters the great stories and myths, the sagas of mythical, legendary, or even historical personalities in the world of the hunter. Today, with the disappearance of big game, old seasoned hunters are little by little becoming living legends through the eulogies sung by the chanters. As at the origin of the confraternity, the two mythical ancestors, after creating the Dangkun altar, danced in a counterclockwise direction. Legend has it that the chanter's harp lute was inherited by genies of nature who used them to lead the legendary horse antelopes. The resonance chamber symbolizes the fecundity of the game, the stretched skin, the sky, where the souls dwell. In fact, a privileged instrument for communicating with the beyond. The great hunters place at the feet of their chief trophies of large game from past hunts. Monkeys, like all the larger game, have principally disappeared from the hunting areas for the village. Nevertheless, hunters who in the past took game with powerful nyama are able in pantomime to simulate tracking them down and killing them. Hunters like performing pantomime. The whole village turns out to watch them. The dancers take pleasure in imitating game in the bush, all their movements. Here this master hunter acts out the part of a monkey, one that is always frightened and constantly defecates, a curious and wasteful monkey. Just as great clowns of the past have done in following the example of animal stories, this is a perfect time to caricaturize the hierarchy. Meanwhile, another hunter plays the role of a diviner in a parody of a session, drawing his table upside down.
The pantomime continues with the enactment of a monkey hunt, where the actors are careful to include all the elements of technique and ritual. The hunters determine wind direction so as not to alert the animal. As in a real hunt, an unforeseen event sometimes slips into the scenario. Here, at the instant of killing the monkey, the rifle doesn't fire. Of course, this is very funny to the assembled spectators. These shows are certainly entertainment for the village, but they are especially part of a young hunter's initiation. The one who reads signs on the ground is also a sorcerer and now starts preparing leaves with magic powers. Hunters use them to thwart any spells on a rifle and to be protected. The hunting pantomime, despite the entertainment it provides and the inevitable laughter it provokes, is a sort of ritual for exercising the nyama. It serves for hunters and other villagers, expiating their fears and fantasies. It also provides physical and mental training, instilling actions for survival in the face of the unexpected. As in a real hunt, once the animal is killed, the hunters perform ritual acts to protect them from the niyama. In the pantomime, the rituals, even the most symbolic, are performed in plain view of everyone. It would seem that through this dance, everyone is united. People of the village, as well as those living out in the bush, are present as one. Transcending the symbolism, Hunter becomes animal both to incarnate and exercise the powerful Niyama. Here a master hunter is put to the test. Carrying this heavy ornamental mask topped with a charm against the Niyama, he demonstrates his power in the form of a buffalo. To prove their strength and acquire prestige, hunters take turns at magic, defying the laws of nature. Here, a master hunter before the astonished gaze of all is going to set a calabash of millet wine on fire. This ritual beverage cements friendships throughout traditional African societies.
Payment is made to the chanting singers, either through a slot in the residence chamber provided for this purpose, or with protective magic charms sewn to their garments, or with initiation secrets. After completing divinations and sacrifices, the chief of the masks authorizes bringing them out. They are first welcomed by the chanters and the masters, and then by all the other hunters. African masks are composites and bear many symbols. So it is that this mask resembling an antelope head is in fact a representation of the great mythical hyena, with its mouth wide open, ready to devour everything its large ears ready to hear everything, and its great horns ready to gore anything. Traditionally, red was the dominant color for masks, but today Islam encourages new converts to color them green. The little mask leading the procession is for the striker. He is in charge of flagellating any sorcerers who may try to cast evil spells. To protect themselves against dangerous effects of Niyama, at the beginning of each year, the hunters prepare a jar of magic potion containing beneficial vital force. Its preparation is ritualized and secret. To sustain the mystery and in order for the magic to work in the eyes of the novices and the villagers, it's concocted in a broken jar. The master hunter in charge of making it as a precaution arranges the bottom of the jar to prevent any water seeping out while the others fan the air with their fly swatters to chase away Nyama. Meanwhile, a master hunter demonstrates his powers by managing to float a cola nut on the surface of the potion. A master hunter informs the assembled that the potion is ready and invites them to its distribution. 
The villagers living alongside the hunters are also in contact with Niyama, and they need protection too. As is customary in many traditional African therapies, the potion can be used as an ablution or it can be drunk. To rid the central village area of any evil force, the hunters wave their fly swatters while whirling about. In this way, they purify the atmosphere, liberating the place of all sorcerers and their spells. Each dancer tries to demonstrate his skill by improvising figures. So it is, for centuries, hunters have waged a spiritual and magical combat against death by trying to tame supernatural forces. Their confraternity is a humanistic school in which knowledge is transmitted by the word, in song, music, dance, and even in pantomime. Although the big game is gone, the confraternity can go on, in an African society seeking to mark its presence to the younger generations, a school for life. Thank you.